This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 722. This week, we welcome Pete Consigli, John Isaacson, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. So, Cliff, let's go to um, Jeremy Beagle. Certified Industrial Hygienist, Best Practices for Mold Assessment, Restoration, and Remediation, How to Document Pre-Existing Damage to Avoid Being Sued, uh, an important topic. Okay. Um, I, I think one of the things he talked about was that there is a lot of bad reporting going on, and a lot of people um, are really technically incompetent uh, in, in Florida. And, you know, they get a license and they go in and they take a bunch of air samples and they make a whole bunch of decisions and, uh, you know, based upon uh, an air sample. In some situations, it's only one air sample. And, uh, you know, what he said is oftentimes the expectation in Florida after an incident is it is they dry, they sample, and then they remove. And one of the points that he said is, did we really have to remove it? And he, he talked about some situations uh, where, where that was not necessary. One of the things very important that he said is testing is secondary, not primary. Hmm. Uh, I talked about protocols and the fact that protocols should be site specific and the protocol should cover the where, the how much, and the how. Uh, yeah. He also mentioned that ASTM has published a mold assessment standard uh, that is not very well known. We know on our show, John Lapotere has been talking about that, uh, you know, for several years. Yes. Um, he talked about that if you are going to take an air sample, you shouldn't take it on the floor. You should take it in the client's <laughs> breathing zone. And uh, he said, what is the purpose of sampling? Sampling should be done for a purpose. And uh, he said the whole sampling industry needs a purpose <laughs> uh, as well. And uh, what is the assessment going to be utilized? For? And he thinks that we need to challenge the current status quo to really provide value, uh, you know, for this investment, uh, you know, in, in having these assessments done. Over to you, John. Yep. Informed, uh, an informed assessment means using a scientific process, exactly like you said, the site-specific protocols rather than generic ones, which kind of builds on what Ken was talking about, even when you're assessing the building. And then uh, making sure that your conclusions are based on the evidence rather than just, you know, not based on evidence or prior applying prior um, thoughts to the, the site rather than allowing the site to speak. Well, let's keep going. Mike McGinnis and Jeremy Beagle, risk assessment model and understanding the roles and goals of multidisciplinary approach to a successful project completion. Cliff? Okay, Jeremy Beagle, risk management. Um, he talked about frequency, money, severity, hazards, events, and, con and consequences. And uh, he talked about what is a competent person. Uh, certification may not have any accreditation, like ACAC has third-party uh, accreditation, the IICRCs uh, does not. Uh, certification may or may not require continuing education. You know, there's some programs you get your license and you're done. Uh, in, in others, in other areas, you have to get the continuing uh, educational uh, credits. Uh, he said the licensing. Uh, may not have any requirement for field experience whatsoever. Um, talked about PRVs, uh, post remediation verification. Uh, in some places, it's air sample clearance. Uh, he's more of a believer, free of visible mold, and confirmation that the remediation protocol has been followed. He pointed out that while the IICRC and other organizations talk about normal fungal ecology, no one has defined what normal fungal ecology is. He pointed out that there is no mold clearance standard. He mentioned that air samples don't reflect the quality of remediation categorization. Uh, he talked about uh, that standards language can be weaponized. 
uh, you know, in reports. He talked that he mentioned that ATP, uh, when you use it, you don't know what you're sampling. And uh, he concurs with Ralph, uh, uh, Dr. Moon, who said ATP is an indicator of cleanliness only. Uh, he then gave a case study of abuse. It was a townhome. Uh, what had happened was the soffits uh, were blown off of these townhome buildings. Uh, there was a big conversation about what type of water was in there. Uh, the the uh, initial uh, testing lab company that went in there thought a category, you know, considered category three. They did a very costly uh, renovation. And, uh, you know, Jeremy had a bunch of photos. And what the photos showed is water really never entered uh, the home. Uh, there was a little bit of moisture in the attic, and that was it. And uh, they based this on one sample that was taken. And the <laughs> sample showed cladosporium and two most common bacillus species and a little bit of yeast. So they had limitation of data. And uh, you know, this ended up uh, being a big abuse in terms of you know, charging a whole lot of money for work that really did not need to be done. Hmm. What was the result on that, Cliff? Did the contractor take a beating? I don't think so. And and this was one of the issues is there's really no penalty, you know, for incompetence. They'd already gotten the money, already gotten away with it. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things that uh, when we get into, Ange you know, Angela, you know, talks about uh, court cases and, you know, what they need in Florida is a couple of, they need to have court cases involving some of these contractors that are either incompetent or, uh, you know, doing this purposefully mm -hmm. and they need to bring some of these guys to the court and they need to have a couple of court cases and, uh, that, you know, that most likely will clean it up. And until that happens, it's not going to get cleaned up. I would imagine they look at the cost versus, you know, the, the benefits and then just say, it's not worth taking it to court, but I could be wrong there. John. Yeah. I, I always, um, Jeremy always has great data. I think uh, Cliff hit on that. One thing that's interesting is I think he said, is it the S760 that the IICCRC is looking at trying to make a new term or some amb ambiguous term that moves away from IEP? So um, a lot of people have opinions about that. So uh, if that's important to you, might want to make your voice heard. Well, it's been heard actually. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I can tell you the word, uh, the def, the uh, abbreviation IEP does not appear in 760 uh, at all. And what happened is in the wildfire standard, uh, they've created a new definition, uh, which I think they're calling competent person. Oh, oh that's and, a new definition. Yes, and and in my in my personal opinion. It is corralling. Okay, so the guys that were on the committee kind of got together and says, we all agree on this. We're going to put up these fences and we're in and anyone outside the fence is out. And if they want to get in, they have to do what we've done, be what we are and, 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 well, and so on and so forth. So what is the term that you would be more of a fan of or is that even the right question? Well, I, I, it's really not the term. It, it's whether there's a need or not. Okay. And I've never been a big fan of, of the how, well, no, I've never been a big fan of what happened with uh, S520, where all of a sudden people who don't know how to do a remediation job are writing protocols. And yeah. most of the time they've never done the job. They don't know how to write a protocol. So they call their buddy and they ask him for one of his protocols. Yeah. And then that becomes their protocol for your project. It's not site specific. And Joe's laughing because he knows it's true. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, that's, that's what happens. And what happens is these guys are running out of mold work and they see fire restoration and wildfire cleanup is, is the next mold is gold. You the know, IEP right. Full Employment Act Part Two. That's right. And it ain't, <laughs> and it ain't, and it ain't gonna happen on my watch if there's anything I can do about it. Oh, so Mike McGinnis, of course, always a, always an interesting character there. Huh? Very, very Jersey Mike. Jersey Go ahead, Mike. Cliff. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Mike did a presentation on risk communication and conflict resolution. 
Again, he always has his four Ps, people, pathways, pressure, and pollutants. And he gave um, a case history of responding to community outrage. There's a school in New Jersey. Uh, they were doing, getting ready to do some construction. They were moving some dirt outside, and they happened to have found some pesticides that had been stored on the property. All of a sudden, you know, word got out. There were pest pesticides there. They brought in an environmental company. You know, they go in, and they get everyone all fired up and so on and so forth. And uh, he had some video, uh, television video of these meetings where they had the mayor, where they had, you know, people from the school district, and they had, you know, in the audience, all these parents, and they're screaming and pointing fingers. And I mean, it's, it's like, it's like a mob. And the whole thing really didn't need, need to happen. And a lot of this was based on, uh, a, you know, poor sampling strategy, and they never sampled the soil outside. And, and Mike ended up having to uh, when Mike got involved, uh, he ended up bringing in people from the state government, uh, physicians and toxicologists and, you know, people that were really, really well respected to kind of help him calm the situation down. And he gave, uh, there was a Dr. Peter Sandman, and this person uh, ha written has written a book. I think he may have done some work for or AIHA, if I'm not mistaken, and it talked about, uh, it, it, w one was responding to community outrage <laughs> strategies for effective risk communication. The other one is risk equals hazard plus outrage. Uh, really, really good stuff. And uh, when asked about what Mike does for a living, his answer is always that he is a building pathologist. And so, we had Dr. Sandman on the show actually a long time ago, Cliff. Risk times outrage equal hazard. I, I forget the yeah. exact formula, but uh, put him in the search box, and that was a great show. John? Hey, Joe. Uh, John, you got any points on McGinnis? I got one little final thing I want to say to him, but go first, John. I think just the the one thing I could add to what Pete said, testing is never your first step. Um, you know, again, very logical process and uh, um, making sure you're doing right by the, the client. Pete. Yeah. One one of the things that Mike, this Mike has done this IQ, the roles and goals and IQ emergency. He's done it for the Bill Turner group before summer camp, the main indoor air quality council and a few others. And at the 2022 winter break, we were asking Siri came close to hosting a, a four hour workshop on this. I, I, but it just didn't come together. I think next year is winter break. If there's enough interest, I want to bring Mike back to do a four hour on this in more detail and what he what he does is he shows all the people that are involved when there's some kind of an emergency in indoor air quality, the consultants, the remediators, the government, the school, all of that. And he shares his experience and, and the roles and goals and where it all fits. I think it'd be very interesting. And uh, we didn't have it before, but I, I could tell. I, I think, uh, you know, he had a few videos and um, anyway, it was interesting. So we're, we're we kind of got that on that. That's kind of in the pipeline. Let's go to the next one. This is John Isaacson, the three P's of project management, people management, project management, and process management. An interpretive presentation of PMBOK's four principles of project management. Cliff, what were your impressions on Mr. Isaacson's presentation? Really, really good presentation. I think he needed a little bit more time though. Uh, I, I think that it was like a fire hose. I mean, he was giving information and being on the receiving end, it was kind of kind of difficult to keep up with it. But the things that I took away were um, that scope drives the estimate, the estimate drives the contract, uh, the importance of thorough data capture and uh, accuracy in this data capture and data input. Um the importance of communication, uh, both positive and negative, uh, you, you need to communicate. Uh, the importance of an agreed scope and understanding what is or isn't in your contract. That project management is an organizational issue and that project managers need the support uh, you know, of the firm and the production team. Um, I never really thought about some of these things, that it's an organizational issue. I never thought about the fact that 
the project manager's project has many determinations made by others. Uh, and uh, other people set the parameters, other people set the price. Uh, and, it, you know, it's the project manager's job to try to bring this in on time and on budget. And, you know, he has, he doesn't have, he doesn't really control his destiny all the time. Um, <laughs> he talked about, you know, people, projects and processes, uh, you know, scheduling, you know, and, and pre-production, production or adaption, uh, procurement. And uh, John also mentioned about, you know, material selections on the part of the client that, you know, they want something that's custom made or, you know, it takes a lot of time. Uh, if, if their materials are not there when the project manager needs them, they, they kind of got to move o over to their next job. They can't just stop and, you know, wait for this stuff, uh, you know, to happen. You know, we talked about uh, integrated uh, project management using a Gantt chart, using a spreadsheet, or you know, having a computer program upon which you can visibly see uh, the information. Um, you know, he he said the same thing that Blockinger said. Top down, a task assigned to everybody is a task assigned to nobody. Um the hmm. importance of having weekly updates and, and on a board, you should be able to see the percentage of each job completed, the estimated date of completion, what work was completed, what's the plan for next week, any delays. And, uh, you know, we updated all the parties. He said that people are always, your people are always the X factor. Uh, he said that project management is a customer management issue. And hiring burnt out contractors as project managers should be renamed customer management. Uh, he <laughs> talked about project uh, uh, management training. Uh, you know, they should be polite, uh, you know, you know, try to create a relevant personal link with the client and then manage the expectations. And uh, said the project management is organizationally dependent. Uh, there's a model on how you should do it, and you should look in a mirror. The thing I, I took about that I thought was uh, you, 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 the most telling comment is when a project manager delivers a project on time and on budget, next time he's going to be expected to do better, to do faster <laughs> and higher profit. And very, very true. Very true. Hey, hey Joe, uh, one quick comment on that I'm off of Cliff's comment. John had submitted this exact presentation rea and it got approved as a breakout session he actually thought he had an hour but I, he has 45 minutes there and so uh i only had a half hour on the program so it was a training wheel thing but at rea he'll have more time to really kind of do detail and tweak it as he wants so well, sounds like kind of cliff the, got a lot of notes out of a half an hour presentation no no cliff got a lot of notes <laughs> and, and john uh, uh really did a good job and he had a nice style about him and uh anyway back to you joe all right. So, John, do you want to add anything or should we move on? I just uh, I, I saw a lot of people falling asleep. Um, so, you know, the blog, if, if you miss anything, Pete's blog will cover it. So. <laughs> yeah, no. Hey, oh, by the way, so the PMBOK, that stands for PMBOK. That is the property, uh, the project management body of knowledge. That's a worldwide organization. It's a 700 page document. Uh, Thank you. I was wondering about that, Pete. All 